In Okinawa, Japan, on Camp Kinzer, almost all of the ammunition for all of the military is stored there. Well, they have both civilians and marines, both armed guarding the ammo storage facility. A lot of my buddies that had to guard the ammo depot would talk about seeing a little boy, around seven years old, running around with no shirt on and being dirty with bruises all over his body. They would be patrolling the facility and see the little boy's face peek around the corner of a quadcon. The Japanese civilians reported seeing a boy as well. When they would tell me the stories, and you could just tell that it scared the living crap out of them, I told them that I could relate. When I was in Haklania, Iraq, we were on patrol, looking for weapon caches, and one house in particular, after we cleared it, had a trap door under one of the bedroom floors. As they were clearing the house, they kept hearing this weird moaning and chains being dragged against something. Well, when they opened this trap door, they see these rickety little stairs leading into darkness, which honestly looked like the entrance to hell. It was pitch black in there, and three combat-hardened marines go and clear the black abyss. As they're peeking around the corner with their flashlights, they see a woman chained to the wall in tattered clothing and covered in feces. She started screaming, and it absolutely scared the crap out of those marines, walking around down there in pitch blackness with little flashlights. It turned out that she was unwell and in her mid-twenties. We found out that her family kept her down there and never let her out because she had a mental deficit and apparently they shunned her. We uncuffed her and had to drag her out while she was still kicking and screaming so we could have our corpsman check on her. I'm not sure what happened to her, but I know the family was taken in by IPS. My last story happened to me when I was stationed at Camp Pendleton in California. I was seeing this cute chick who worked at a bar in Pacific Beach. One night I go to pick her up and we were going to go out for drinks. When I get there, she tells me her neighbors are coming along as well. We go across the street to her neighbors and this young married couple had a three-year-old boy and the babysitter at their house. We leave, get wasted, and get back after the bars close. We go back to their place and the wife starts getting upset because the babysitter didn't put the kid to bed and it was very late. So me and the husband go to the fridge to grab some more beers. The babysitter is telling the mom that she had put him to bed on time, but the kid kept crawling out of bed and going straight for the glass door facing the backyard. That's where the kid was when we got there and he didn't even move when we walked in. So the mom goes to the kid and asks him what he's looking at. The kid tells her that there's a little boy standing in the backyard, that he has red eyes with upside down plus signs in his eyes. The entire house went quiet. It scared everyone and the babysitter started freaking out because he'd been staring at that door for so long. We peek outside with the porch light on and we see nothing. There's no way that kid could have been that descriptive just using his imagination. Plus, upside down plus signs sounds a lot like upside down crosses to me and that's a no. We left shortly after that, but everyone in the house was pretty uneasy. I started working as a civilian in the MOD, which meant that I spent six months living on an RAF base, Odaham, Chinooks. For around a week, I woke up every single morning at the same time. I can't remember which hour it was, 
but it was on the hour, either 1 a.m. or 3 a.m., dead on. I know because I texted my girlfriend daily as it happened. Usually things like, woken up again, and then I remember by the end it was sort of a running joke. Yep, right on schedule, 3 a.m., wide awake. This happened for two weeks. Sometimes I would hear a noise in my room from the cupboard. One day, the sink started dripping. This was a very old building, World War I era, built in 1925, and it's used to film scenes of Downton Abbey. On the final day this happened, my TV turned on to a terrestrial TV channel. I had no aerial in it. There was no aerial around. It was literally a shell that I plugged my memory stick in to play whatever films I had downloaded onto it. There was 100% no way that any sort of TV signal could be getting into this old-style flat screen that required an aerial. I got up groggily and turned it off, went back to bed, shut my eyes, and the sound of static started coming out of the TV, getting louder and louder, as if somebody was increasing the volume. The TV screen was off. I literally ran up and ripped the plug from the socket, and it stopped. As I got into bed, though, and turned my light off, I noticed the red on-and-off LED at the bottom of the set flickering. I texted my girlfriend and basically said, what's going on, and laughed to myself when I noticed the time. 3 a.m. on the dot. I just went back to sleep. As my time on that base went on, I got edgier and more nervous around the wardrobe. I don't know why. Nothing happened to it. But I remember constantly having to check that nobody was in there. Like, the longer my stay on that base was, the more paranoid I got. That somebody, or something, was in there. My first duty station was Naval Station Pearl Harbor, Hawaii. I know, rough gig for a 19-year-old kid, right? I was a military police officer. I was there from 2004 to 2007 and bounced between bases. Near the end of my time, I got reassigned to the Naval Magazine in Iwa Beach and patrolled that base from early 2007 until I transferred in October. This base is comprised of the main magazine complex in Iwa itself, the old base at Barbers Point in Kapolei, and another magazine complex at Nanakuli. For my first couple of months, as my welcome aboard and as the newest, most junior guy, I got the lucky experience of patrolling the main mag area on night shift, 10 p.m. to 6 a.m. This area is approximately 7,000 acres of pitch-dark ammo magazines spread throughout the woods, the only light being from your headlights and overheads. Once you make your way to the gate of the mag area, I always had to park the truck, get out, and walk to the gate, open it, drive through it, then get back out and lock the gate behind me. I always had the weirdest, creepiest feeling that I was being watched from the woods whenever I had to get out and open the gate. Mind you, to the left of the woods was an old abandoned base housing neighborhood that was closed down in the mid-1990s due to budget, and it was completely overgrown with vegetation. Because I worked night shift, patrolling this large complex of row upon row of ammo magazines intermixed with dense vegetation was the scariest experience of my life. Normally, I would just haul ass from the complex gate down to the piers where the only lights were located and move all my vehicle mirrors so that they faced inward and there was no way I could look at them for fear of seeing something behind me. I absolutely hated making my rounds and those eight hours from 2200 to 0600 were the most dreaded feeling I ever had when assigned a mag patrol. There were times that radios would play music in the little shacks used by the day workers on the pier, maybe left on by the workers when they left, that I would shut off 
and when I made my way back an hour or so later, those things would be playing music again. There were buildings that I would just speed past, because I swear that things were watching me from whatever was left of the windows. I never, ever turned my lights off. Those poor patrol vehicles. I always had my interior lights on, high beams, alley lights, takedowns. I mean, I was a one-man light show spectacular. Some of the older Department of Defense police would refuse to patrol the main mag complex because of stories that had been passed down over the years. The reason why they never used their mirrors was because of the story of a woman in a white dress who wandered the complex and would appear in your rearview mirror at random times. It's a practice I quickly adopted, turning my mirrors inward, like I said before. With total seriousness, I told my supervisor every evening that I was assigned to mag patrol that if my vehicle ever broke down out there in those woods, in pitch darkness, all alone, with the only set of keys in and out, well, it was a pleasure working with him, because I was not going to sit in that dark and wait for help to arrive. You can read between those lines. I've been in the Navy for four years so far. I'm operational on my first ship, and I've been underway a couple of times. I'm a corpsman, a medical guy on the ship, and beside the other corpsmen, I have my own group of friends that I hang out with. A couple of machinist mates and a couple of CSs, cooks. They're a little dumb, but they're cool. Well, after being underway for three weeks, we were pulling back into our home port and doing line handling, rigging the ship to the pier. And for those people who think the Navy isn't dangerous, let me tell you, people die and get hurt all the time, and this is one of the problems. One of my CS friends was doing the line handling and had lines snap back. These nylon lines snap back at the speed of a bullet, and they will rip through anything. Except it snapped where the men were standing, and that CS, we'll call him G, was the only one hurt somehow. I didn't see it happen. G lost both of his legs. The lines somehow ripped them off. Me and another doc tried to save him, but he passed. I still beat the crap out of myself every day for it. But a few months later, we went underway again. It was about six days into it, and I had watch. It was from midnight to 6 a.m. I was tired as hell and walking back to my berthing where everybody sleeps and had my first weird occurrence. Every time I walked, something was ahead of me, like I heard footsteps on the metal floor ahead of me. That in itself wasn't weird, but I was curious as to who was there, so I tried walking faster, and the footsteps matched my pace. I did a test and stopped moving. It went quiet. I walked again, and it started again, so I tried to ignore it. The second thing happened the next night. I was up late until about midnight. Ship life makes you work 12-hour workdays, if you're lucky, and I was going to sleep. But I kept waking up because somebody was walking past my bed, loudly. It didn't wake anyone else up, I guess, because nobody else knew about it when I asked. I tried peeking my head out to see who it was a couple of times. Once when they walked past, and once when I heard them coming up. Every time I did, it stopped, and nobody was there. It was like I imagined all of it. I spoke to people, and they just said things like, maybe it was somebody from a different birthing, or maybe it was an officer. I have no idea why someone would stay up or skip their duty, risking getting in major trouble just to walk a berthing, or why an officer would even go near our berthing. The most likely thing I hear was that it was somebody on watch. Maybe? But nobody in their boots sounded like this thing. It wasn't heavy sounding, just different. That's what kept me up. Other things happened too. About two weeks in, there was a guy on watch topside. 
He started a man overboard alarm and we all had to muster. But literally everybody was accounted for. When someone falls off the ship, they make everyone get together to see if we have everybody and see who's missing. But everyone was there. They didn't find anybody in the water either. The guy on watch got Captain's mast and I talked to him. He claims he saw someone in a uniform sprint and jump off the ship. Before that, he said he was just staring at him in a dark area. Could barely make him out. Personally, I'm surprised he could see anything because it's almost pitch black out at night. He said that before he could call out to the guy, he ran and jumped off. Weird, right? I am active Navy and spent a little over two years in Seoul, Korea. Awesome experience, tons of things to see. My work schedule was pretty nice, only worked half the month. We call it the Panama schedule for those who don't know what I'm talking about. But anyway, a few times a year my work would ask for volunteers to do a security detail that spanned over a whole month. It'd consist of tops four guys for a whole month. We were given the house, individual rooms, kitchen, gym, etc. This assignment was on a military base, but on that military base, our house and facilities were also gated and only cleared members, so just the four of us for the month, were allowed in. You had to have a code to get inside our gate as well as a code to get inside the house. Pretty well secured to say the least. There were two buildings within our gated and secured area, one being the house we lived in, and no more than 30 feet away was the other building that we worked out of. Usually, there was one person working a watch shift. It was always manned. So I just get off my watch and I go into the house to relax. I go about my nightly routine and take my uniform off and get ready for a shower. Our bathroom has one shower and three toilet stalls. Not a big bathroom either. Anyway, I'm the only one awake. One guy is in the other building standing watch, and the other two are passed out in their private rooms. I turn the shower off and grab my towel. Directly in front of the shower is the wall to one of the stalls, and I hear as clear as day the sound of a toilet paper roll being rolled, as if someone was grabbing the paper. The typical dung gung 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 sound, if you know what I mean. I figured someone was using it. No big deal, right? I didn't say anything. That'd be rude. And I just continued drying off and I pulled the curtains back and walked to the sink as I looked in the mirror. That stall door was open and no one was in there. I opened the bathroom door because it was closed this whole time and the two other people were still in their rooms totally passed out. I knew I wasn't hearing things or tripping out. It's impossible to get into the bathroom without the doors making noise. They're really loud. It's kind of weird, right? But here's my favorite encounter. It could have been within the same month that I was already there at this facility, but I can't say for certain because I did multiple trips to this place and something always happened. But almost the same scenario. I got off watch and I was watching a movie in the living room with the lights off. Two guys were sleeping in their rooms, doors closed, and the fourth person was in the other building on watch. Out of nowhere, I hear the front door, which is metal, being tugged really hard, as if somebody was trying to open it after they put in the door code. The front door didn't open due to whoever putting in the code doing it wrong, I suppose. I've heard the same sound countless times. I was like, maybe it's a contractor who's supposed to be here and tried getting in but forgot the code and now he'll try the rear entrance to get in since there is no code there. It's just a free swinging door. So I waited a couple of seconds to see if anybody was going to walk in and no one did. I get off the couch and go through to the rear to see if anybody's out there and nobody was. The other two people were still fast asleep and the other one was still working. Not a single car in the parking lot. I still can't figure out what that was. 
And no, it wasn't the wind either. It was dead still. But the one thing that makes me confident in what I heard and experienced was my last trip to this facility. It was when I was on watch. Three of my other guys came storming in the building, freaking out, because they all experienced the same thing. It was super late at night. It was just the four of us total in our gated area, highly secure, like I said. Those three were watching a movie in the living room while I was in the building behind them. That's when they heard the sound of someone yanking on the front door, trying to get in. There was no one on the compound, no car in the lot. It was just us. Every single one of them heard the same thing I did, and when they came into the building I was working in, I described my experience to them, and it was exactly the same as theirs. Kind of creepy, but I dig shit like this, so I was intrigued too. There were also some papers randomly falling in my workspace, and sounds of someone stomping on the floor of the workspace, but nothing like the experiences I just mentioned. Before I forget, as soon as I reported to my base in Korea, one of the airmen that I worked with said he saved a video from one of those security details because they caught a gray, hazy figure panning across one of the cameras in the middle of the night. I never saw the video, but multiple people that I worked with said that they had seen it, and with the things I experienced down there, I think it's safe to say that I believe it's credible. But, yeah, that's what I experienced. In 2010, I was in Kyrgyzstan and was working MIDS, United States Air Force Security Forces. I was on a Delta patrol, which was in charge of a two-mile wide field, watching over our planes as they landed and making sure that none of them were going to get blown up or shot at. Highly unlikely in that area. Anyway, it was around two in the morning and we got word on the radio that we had a plane coming in in about 10 minutes. So we would go to the spot, just me and my Alpha, in an old four-door Nissan truck that was handed down to us from Iraq. Our spot was on top of a hill in the middle of nowhere. There was an old abandoned barn from who knows when. Well, to give you a mental picture, there's a small little dirt road that leads up to the hill, surrounded by tall grass and marijuana plants. It was wild out there. And once we got to the top, we were met with the dark barn that was falling apart. Well, when I was up the hill, I turned the vehicle around to have the barn behind me and to overlook the entire dark field. Once I was in position, I turned off the engine and lights, and I only had the radio on to some Russian music station. I pulled the handbrake, truck was a standard, and just sat back just to realize that my Alpha had fallen asleep. I thought to myself, hey, not a bad idea. I might as well take a short 15 minute nap as well. So as I turned the car stereo off and turned my handheld radio up, I heard a faint feminine scream coming from the barn. Keep in mind, we were the only people within a half mile radius. It creeped me out and I stayed super silent to see if I heard it again, nothing. So I played it off and decided it was just my imagination playing tricks on me. Well, I laid back in my seat just a little more and just started overlooking the field again, when all of a sudden the whole truck jerked violently, as if it had gotten rammed from behind by another vehicle. It was to the point where my alpha woke up and started yelling, What the fuck did you hit, dude? And that's when I replied, Dude, nothing, look where we're at. The car is off, I didn't do shit. We got out of the truck and got our flashlights and started looking around thinking maybe some sort of big animal ran into us or possibly a big mountain lion that was spotted in the area might have jumped on the truck bed. But we saw nothing. There were no signs of anything being up there with us. We even took out our night vision goggles and thermals and saw nothing. This is when we decided to just get out of there and go back to check up on the people at other posts and tell them our experience. I told them about the scream I'd heard earlier and there were a few guys who said that they had heard it too, 
and that it bugged them to the point where they did a walk around of the barn. They saw that there was no way of getting in since everything was chained up, and the only way in was through a few of the open windows way up top. Till this day, none of us can explain how that sort of force was possible with nothing physical being there to make it. Among the many ghost stories told during lull periods of lengthy military exercises, the one that stood out the most in Singapore is probably that of the third door of Charlie Company. In short, it was about how a third door was made. To allow the spirit of a recruit who died a gruesome and mysterious death to leave peacefully. There was even a local movie. There was even a local movie made about the incident called Tooth Right. <laughs> Okay. There was even a local movie made about the incident called 2359 that you can find on YouTube. I have personally seen this third door, so there was at least some credence to the story. My story, however, happened many years later when the camp was largely unused. Happened many years later when the camp was largely unused. My company was planning to use the rifle range near the camp for our annual rifle proficiency test, which lasted several days. I was selected to be a part of the very small advance party that would arrive a few days before the main body. The barracks of the camp were essentially long houses, separated by their respective toilets and laundry areas. My platoon mates and I would occupy one of those long houses during the night where we would play cards and tell creepy stories to pass the time. It was almost midnight and I needed to relieve myself. I had just stepped out of the barrack when I noticed that the lights of the toilet belonging to Charlie Company had suddenly come on. The bright white light cast a clear shadow of a man onto the water area of the laundry. I froze. There was a voice telling me to go investigate while another told me to grab my friends. The shadow didn't seem to budge at all during the entire time that I was observing it. Then I heard my friend calling for me. This snapped me out of my reverie as I rushed back in and pulled my friends out to show them what I saw. However, by then the lights had already gone off. My friend suggested that it was probably the range warden, which was the only logical explanation. What really puzzled me was that my friend called out to me because I'd been gone for too long but in my mind, the whole thing had only lasted a minute or two. The next day, I quizzed the range warden about the incident and asked him if he'd been out there. A worried look came over his face and he explained that he was nowhere near the camp that night. What's more perplexing was that the power to Charlie Company had been cut off years ago. I'm stationed at the School of Infantry West on Camp Pendleton, California. Everything I'm telling you has been told to me by people who I trust, and people who have no reason to lie to me. Three to four years ago, a young private, last name James, committed suicide on one of the rifle ranges during Marine Combat Training, or MCT. There was no note, and nobody knew why he did it. I was able to dig a little and confirm an obituary that matches the timeline, and a social media profile that goes silent around the time of death as well. Instructors at MCT have had inexplicable events occur at the place of his death. Gear falling off of shelves, cold spots, things like that. A group of students even bought a cheap Ouija board and tried to contact him one night. The next morning, visibly shaken. They wouldn't go into detail about what happened, other than hearing locker doors shut on their own and more objects falling. The instructor on duty that night began having disturbing dreams about his own house. He saw a cloaked figure in some kind of religious garb in a specific closet in his home. He never talked about it, but one day he got a call from his wife, 
and she brought up that their dog wouldn't stop barking and whimpering at that very same closet door. Finally, a different instructor, a staff sergeant, was out at the range where the private had died. It had started to get dark. He was absolutely the only one out there. Everyone else had left. He heard a voice saying, Good evening, Staff Sergeant. He tried calling out and asking who it was, even looking out with a flashlight, but he found nothing. The voice kept repeating itself until eventually he got freaked out and left. I know troubled spirits can hang around for some of the same reasons that they would have taken their own life to begin with, not being able to let go, etc. This is the only reason why I believe any of it, other than that I trust the people who told me. Has anybody else heard similar things? Once I was walking home with a friend on one of the trails around our town. We were almost to the end of the trail and I could just see the road and sidewalk ahead lit up by a street light. It was around 11 p.m. or so and we were just chatting about stupid things that had happened at school that Friday morning. I was looking ahead the whole time and saw movement straight ahead of us. I paused and stopped walking. I thought maybe it was a deer, but it seemed much larger. My friend looked at me and asked what was wrong. I told her that I thought I saw something. She told me to stop freaking her out, so we laughed it off and continued on. About 10 seconds later, we were almost to the sidewalk. As clear as day out of the trees and bushes came this really tall, dark silhouette of what looked like a man with deer antlers on his head. My eyes watered up and I could feel the heat of my body spread in an instant. Adrenaline was pumping out of control and I just stood there and watched as it just glided across the trail into a patch of woods on the other side. I just remember saying, what? And looking to my friend. The figure had no legs. It was just a straight rectangular body and a head with what looked like antlers. Based on what I saw from where we were standing, my guess is that it was at least eight feet tall. My friend just looked at me with the most disturbed look. I remember it like it was yesterday. It's been about two years and I'm still too afraid to walk the trails at night. We decided to ball up and just run for the sidewalk and head straight home. I've read about shadow people before, but none of them had antlers. Do you have any idea what we saw? I don't usually talk to people about this kind of thing, but my family has a past of dealing with the paranormal. Something happened to me that I can't really explain, and I was just wondering if this type of thing has happened to anybody else. When I was young, about eight years old, my parents had bought this house and got it moved onto our land. Before the house was even moved, my grandmother had a dream about the house and was concerned with us getting it, saying that it was haunted. The dream was so detailed that she knew where everything was in the house before ever stepping foot in it. She never said anything about this until after we'd already bought the house and got settled in. So here's where it gets odd. After living in this house for a couple of years now, I would occasionally hear noises and footsteps throughout the house after everybody was in bed. Sometimes I would get up and check, and my family would be asleep. We used to have a recording of a man's voice saying, United we stand during most of the night. Oh. We used to have a recording that we got once of a man's voice saying, United we stand. During most of my nights in this house, I would have weird dreams about the military. I never had any dreams like that before. Well, one night I had an extremely detailed dream about being inside of a tank. I remembered all the controls in the tank and driving through a tunnel. In my dream, a grenade got thrown and came in the top hatch and blew it up, killing people inside and outside the tank. 
It was so vivid that it woke me up in a full sweat and scared me. The morning after having this dream, I was telling my grandmother about it. She used to babysit me on certain nights, all night when my parents worked, to have me ready for school in the morning. She told me that she had had the exact same dream that night, but she was walking outside the tank. It was just as detailed as my dream, and everything matched up, from the uniform color, even to the path we were on. How is it possible for us to have the exact same dream from different points of view? Has this ever happened to anyone else? This isn't my story, but it's an interesting story about some paranormal activity involving something in the military. My uncle was deployed in D-Day during World War II. He made it past the beaches and survived a few days, but he died soon after the invasion started. This was in the 40s, so news didn't travel as quickly as it does now. Weeks, sometimes months, would pass before families would ever be notified of a death. Supposedly, on the day that my uncle died, my great-grandmother was sitting on the porch alone when my uncle, dressed in his full military uniform, walked up to the porch and sat down next to her. He told her that he'd just been killed in an invasion in France, in a tank explosion, that he hadn't suffered, and that he was going to a better place. Understandably, my great-grandma started freaking out and ran into the house and told everybody what had happened. Everyone told her to relax. After all, France was German-occupied, so how could he have died there? Flash forward a few weeks or months and they received the notification that my uncle had died in a tank explosion in France on the day that he had come to comfort my great-grandma. Night Convoy, Route 1 from Delaram to Camp Bastion, March or April of 2008. I was the gunner for one of the trucks, and I saw a weird glowing thing through my night vision goggles a few hundred meters from the road. It's hard to describe. Imagine glowing blades that just pulsate inside of a triangle. No actual triangle, just as though it were inside one. And it would pulsate at regular intervals. I asked if anybody else saw it, and they said no. There were also two more, way farther out though. Another time, October-November of 2007 in Camp Bastion, a buddy and I were going from our tent in the marine section to the gym close to the cafeteria, aka go on road as if you're going to the Danish portion of the base, take a left at the intersection, go straight a few hundred meters and you'll be at the gym. When we turned left on the road, a shadow went the opposite way. There were no lights on our left side, therefore no shadow should have been on our right. We sprinted the rest of the way. This happened at the Naval Magazine. I was luckily assigned to patrol the old air station at Barber's Point. It's a base that the Navy closed down and gave back to the state of Hawaii. Residential neighborhoods and things like that, but we still maintained a few of the facilities there, and there were some cabins on the beach that only the Navy could rent out, so we patrolled the area in conjunction with the Honolulu Police Department. Anyone who's ever lived in Hawaii can tell you, the whole Waiani coast is like South Central LA. The worst of the worst live out there, so we always had to keep our head on a swivel. Crazy locals didn't care if you were Honolulu PD or Base PD. If you got in their way, they were going to come at you, no matter what. So one night it's getting close to the end of my shift, maybe like 3am, and I'm doing a perimeter check of the beach cabins. 
I park my unit and I'm walking the fence line when this girl jumps at me from the other side of the fence. She isn't Hawaiian. She looks more like a really dark Hispanic woman and her face is just covered in dirt. I unholstered really quickly just in case, but when I realized that she was just getting my attention, put my weapon away. This is how horror movies start, right? So I ask her if she's okay. She apologizes for trespassing on military property. He explains that she was out here cruising with her boyfriend when he got mad and started hitting her. She jumped out of the car and the only place she felt safe was jumping the fence onto our property. Well, she isn't military or a dependent, so I can't really do anything to her, but I do take her license and I run her for warrants. Just my luck, she comes up with some small warrants out of Southern California. I ask my dispatcher to contact Honolulu PD and send a unit out to my location, and I apologize to her. It's just a routine procedure. She understands, although she's irritated, but none of her warrants justify being arrested. Plus, California isn't going to ask for her back because of some minor warrants. The Honolulu police show up, treat her like crap, and they have a pissing match while I just stand there, and then he gives her back her license and leaves. She asks me if she's free to go, and I say yes. I finish my check about five minutes after she leaves, and I figure... I feel bad about how HPD cops treated her, and it's a really long walk to the main road, maybe five to six miles. It's really late, too. As I'm driving down the only road between these cabins and the main road, I'm trying to see this chick walking on the side of the road, but she's gone. There is no way in hell this girl walked five to six miles in five minutes. I don't know where she disappeared to, I would have seen another car if her boyfriend came back or something like that. But there's nothing along the road besides deep woods, and I'm pretty sure she didn't just walk into the jungle at 1 o'clock in the morning. I'm not trying to say she wasn't real or anything, it's just weird. Because to this day, I have no idea where she went. Just weird.